This is Carbon Mike. Godfrey Bloom has been there and done that. A soldier in the British Yeomanry, who later became a colonel in the Dragoons, and later a logistics officer in the 4th Armored Division. An investment manager in the City of London, later a chief executive. A staunch Brexiteer and member of the UK Independence Party, who went on to represent his country as a member of the European Parliament. Love him or hate him, and there are many people in both camps, Godfrey Bloom has come down, in every political struggle I can remember, on the side of liberty and sovereignty, on the side of ordinary people against the overreaching bureaucrats who would be their masters. Recently, I had the pleasure of speaking with him about a variety of events, both historical and current, on dangerous space. I wanted to start off with a quote, uh, and those who follow my content know that I'm always resorting to G.K. Chesterton, which was one of my favorite English men of letters. And I believe this was in Eugenics and Other Evils. Uh, and the quote is, the state has suddenly and quietly gone mad. It is talking nonsense and it can't stop. I'd like to just use that as a jumping off point for you to give me your take on the on the current political madness. Well, it's interesting you should uh, use that quotation. Um, in 19, uh, sorry, in, uh, let's see, where were we? On 2018, on the anniversary of what we call over here the Great War, I gave a lecture to the London School of Economics uh, on how... Great Britain could have stayed out of the war to the benefit of all Europe uh, and brokered a peace. And I think if there's one uh, demonstration of how the world went mad, it was in uh, July and August of 1914. That's when the world went mad. Uh, when we got involved in a, when we got involved in uh, a war, uh, which was the most ghastly and costly in both blood and treasure for, well, in the history of humankind. Because you have to accept, as my grandfather once I referred, my grandfather was badly injured on the Messine Ridge in 2017. Uh, and I referred once to the Second World War, and he looked over his newspaper, it was a dry old stick, and he said, boy, there was only one war. It came in two parts. There you go, yes. Uh, and of course, he's absolutely right, and that's been my view basically ever since. And I've been a student of that war ever since, and uh, lectured and written on that particular subject. Um, as I say, it was the worst thing in human history, uh, because if you add up the casualties uh, in the Great War, and then you add up the casualties uh, in between the wars... Uh, the purges from Stalin and so on and so forth, and then into the 1939-1945 phase and the tragedy that that brought in 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 in, in deaths. Uh, we know that that was positively ghastly, and it was done uh, with over the Austrians having an argument with Serbia, which dragged in Russia, which dragged in Germany, which dragged in France and eventually dragged in Britain, totally unnecessarily, stupid, uh, but we got ourselves involved as well. The war was nothing whatsoever to do with us. So it's a wonderful example, in my view, of 1914, where the whole world went mad uh, to, to great cost. And I see now we seem to have a, 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 a major problem, do we not? When we look at what we've seen in the so-called fake pandemic of the covid hoax, uh, we saw people walking around, even on beaches and walking around country lanes with face masks, <laughs> an absurdity you simply couldn't believe, believing that some sort of piece of cloth over your face could stop a respiratory virus. You couldn't think of anything quite so stupid. My wife's a medic. And my wife, her final dissertation before she qualified was on the dangers of masks. Correct. And she qualified in 1984. Uh, not without uh, some irony in that particular date. But there we are, uh, madness. Uh, and now we're dealing with uh, the side effects, which nobody will admit to, uh, on the uh, implications uh, of the spike protein, experimental spike protein therapy, which nobody even now 
in government is prepared to acknowledge. So that's madness. Yes. So we had a whole world masked up, uh, submitting to experimental spike protein. Um, quite extraordinary. Yet here in the Ukraine, when we talk about the Ukraine and the Russian Federation, people seem to have no fear, no fear of a nuclear war. Correct. Uh, why are they? Why are they so frightened about something which was no more than a flu bug, but seem to be totally at ease yes. on the abyss of a nuclear war? Quite extraordinary. It, it is quite extraordinary. I mean, I grew up in in um, around the tail end of the Cold War. You know, I was a, I was a kid in the seventies, and um, and in the eighties, I remember. Um, I remember that, that 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 was this kind of pervasive dread that someone would quote unquote push the button. And later on, as I started studying these things, I found out uh, that we'd had quite a number of close calls over the years. The Cuban Missile Crisis, which is kind of replaying itself in an interesting way right now in Ukraine. The Cuban Missile Crisis was, was kind of only the most, uh, how can you say, the most visible close call that we've had, but there have been others. And I, I'm with you. I can't, I, I can't understand why, you know, what it means that we have a political class that is so cavalier about nuclear war. Oh, well, let's just touch off a couple of tactical nuclear warheads to show that we mean business. It's a theater of madness. Um, I've been particularly interested in, in the roots of our current problems. Like you, I'm kind of obsessed with the First World War. My ex-sister-in-law is a physician, a somewhat prominent one, and we used to talk often. We'd talk about medicine and, and, and her craft. And uh, I remember one thing she told me one time, it might have been over lunch, was that the difference between a good doctor and a great doctor is not technology, it's not imaging, it's not instruments, it's not pedigree. It's the ability to take a patient history. And I found that fascinating, and I, I never forgot that exchange. And uh, reading one of your essays in which you talk about uh, the, the the kind of the, the run up to World War One and, and and the kind of the, the the missed opportunities and the lack of political imagination, you said, "I would make the study of modern history compulsory for world leaders. It might stop it repeating itself." Indeed. You, like me, will look at these people and just wonder um, how we can continue to make the same mistakes time and time again. I think we have a problem in that there is a really serious lack of what I would call a traditional education amongst our politicians. Yes. Uh, they might have a piece of paper that they put in a frame and they hang in their downstairs lavatory to say that they got a 2-1 from Oxford or whatever it happens to be. Um, there's pictures of them with their mortarboards getting their degrees at whatever university they went to, but I would not regard them. I would not regard them as men who are educated, men or women who are educated. Uh, and I've met lots of these. I've been on platforms with lots of these. I've been on chat shows with these people. And their ignorance is really quite astonishing, not just about history, but almost about anything. Yes, um, correct, yes. They, <laughs> there was one, it's sort of slightly off the wall, Mike, but it was quite interesting on Question Time, which was one of our big question things. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's very stereotyped. It's got a left-wing audience. It's got a left-wing panel. It's got a left-wing everything. Um, but somebody in the audience actually said, uh, there's about five people on the panel who's supposed to be the great and the good, if they could quote any poetry. Hmm. And they hmm. couldn't. Wow. None of them could co quote any poetry. Don't you find that not just amusing in some sense, but absolutely terrifying? It is, yes. The, the fact that somebody can be on a TV panel and not be able to just be able to quote some poetry. I wouldn't expect people to necessarily to be quote much poetry, but I mean, I could have quoted poetry on the programme for most of the programme if I'd wanted to, do, and I don't consider myself to be any way an expert on poetry. Uh, and it's just one of those things that, that that's how badly educated they were yes. uh, from a traditional perspective. And and they didn't even seem embarrassed particularly by it. <laughs> no, no. They, they, well, they, they almost, you almost get the sense that they wear their ignorance like a badge. And it's, I mean, I say ignorance, but it, it's its worse than that. It's it, its a kind of, a, I'd love to get, get your take on this, but it seems to me like looking at these people, 
try to reason about matters, and I use the word reason charitably, it, it, it seems to me that it's a kind of radical ignorance combined with a, um, a radical adherence to a handful of epistemic templates that they then use to make sense of everything. But so, so they have the wrong instruments and they're using them in the wrong way to make sense of a scenario that they don't have the tools to even understand, the cognitive tools, the reasoning tools to understand. I find that extraordinary. I mean, especially, you know, the people in, in, um, in Great Britain, you would think that especially because Great Britain bore more of the cost of this colossal waste, as you say, this, this great world war with an intermission, you would think that your political class had a little or would have a little bit more sense. But I think you're quite right. It, it goes right back to, to kind of foundational education, the lack thereof. When, what was his name? Cameron, our Prime Minister Cameron was in America uh, a few years ago. Uh, he was on a sort of program. He was being interviewed. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how it came into the conversation, but Magna Carta came into the, co- the conversation, of course, of which there is a fair copy uh, uh, in Washington. Yes. Uh, and with all, uh, whenever I'm in America, when, uh, in Washington, is always proudly pointed out to me. Um, and of course, uh, the Magna Carta was only enshrining the basic uh, laws, uh, Anglo-Saxon laws. It was enshrining them. It was documenting them, if you will, yes. um, codifying them. Um, so the uh, depth of that law has gone back since before Magna Carta in 1215, well before. Uh, and it was so good, the system of law, that the Normans actually adopted it when they invaded. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could see that it was of a good point. And, of course, the Americans uh, are the same. The, the Americans uh, uh, adopted as well in, 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 in much uh, of its original form, it, it, which really is a, the form of nat- natural justice, if you will, yes. uh, locally, locally provided with 12 good men and true uh, and so on and so forth, uh, your, your local jury, all of this. Uh, all of this is fundamental to both our nations. Um, Cameron couldn't really discuss it in any depth. He looked frightened and bewildered when the subject came up. Uh, he then, uh, we got on then, the, the, the conversation then drifted into the Second World War, where he, he, he could, to quote him, he said, oh, well, of course, we were the junior partner. Um, and I thought... This country stood alone uh, uh, when the, na- the, uh, ne- the Nazi uh, Soviet non aggression pact was signed. The Americans didn't come in until significantly later, um, all of which is fine, all of which I understand. And, and this is not a criticism of anybody involved. But not to know that, yes. to not to know that uh, in a British prime minister is terrifying. It was hushed up here. His ignorance was hushed up here. Um, and of course, uh, if you look, I think it was coming up. It was the uh, D-Day celebrations. Yes. Uh, um, June 1944. D-Day says, now, interestingly enough, when it comes to junior partnerships, actually there were more British Empire troops on the invasion of Normandy on that day than there were Americans. Mm. Uh, uh, the, we had three. There were th- uh, three. There was a Canadian army, two British armies, uh, and there were two American armies. And, of course, they were fighting in the Pacific. And when the war went on, of course, uh, American man- manpower came to the fore, uh, big style, as you would expect it to be. And I understand that. We all understand that as historians. But to come out with a question that was derogatory to our own country, derogatory to Great Britain, which was also untrue, yes. what prompted him to make... Did he think that sort of arse licking of an American <laughs> interviewer uh, would somehow, uh, you know make him popular in America or popular at home. It's, it's the crass ignorance. And this man got a first at Oxford. He got a first at Oxford in, uh, in, in PPE. What? Yes, he got a first in PPE, which is um, uh, economically f- philosophy and so on. So what I know oh, it's called, it's that, a new well, subject. PPE. Well, that, ex- that explains a lot. <laughs> it's like yeah. Cameron uh, yeah. is an economic philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> It's not a proper subject. And, of course, we all know from the pictures and all the rest of it that he spent the entire time uh, getting drunk. Right. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I get, I'm get i drunk half the time as well. Um, <laughs> but there we are. Uh, but this this guy um, is what, really, if he, outside politics, he'd be one of life's losers. He was a loser. He looks like a loser. Yes. And he was 
he was uh, followed by Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, an appallingly hopeless woman who really, really should be ma- ma- managing perhaps at best a tea shop in Chipping Camden in the Cotswolds <laughs> or something like that, miles above. And then blow me down, um, blow me down, we get Boris, um, who blusters, talks a good story, uh, but doesn't know anything at all about anything and hopes it'll be all right on the night. Right. Um, you can't really run a country like that. And he, he boasted, ah, I don't do attention, I don't do detail. Well, of course, that's when that's your manipulated. If you're a politician or a president or a prime minister who doesn't do detail, that is how you are manipulated by people who do. That is correct. That is correct. And by the way, look, I can even I could even forgive someone who kind of unabashedly says they don't do detail provided provided that they have the foundations right. And you see, the real problem I have with these people is they don't even have the foundations right. For example, they don't understand what law is for. And you see, when when Chesterton was talking about the anarchy of the state, the idea that you have an out of control state uh, that doesn't know what law is and therefore doesn't know where law should stop, where where law should leave off. This looks very much like what we have. And again, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that you went right back to World War I um, as, as being the beginning of a long downward slide. From this same essay that I, that I was reading of yours, you said, war is always the arch enemy of personal freedom. The pre-Great War British and American societies by today's standards were enormously liberal. Rules, regulations, identification documents, That abomination, conscription, the inevitable rise in power of the petty officialdom, the abandonment of principles of law, all these are claimed as vital for the common good, moreover deceitfully claimed as temporary. It started in all its ghastly evil in August 1914. So to your point, I don't think it can be overstated. Uh, the the big smoking hole we blew in our own foundations as so-called uh, 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 democratic nations, as 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 nations that they're supposed to um, supposed to have a a a a, a law governed well, some law governed nations uh, with with some degree of liberty for their citizenry. These people talk a great game. But they again, they have no, they have no foundations. You're absolutely right. Um, we have drifted so far away um, from it, the, and the principles of English law, which are the same principles broadly speaking in America, uh, are very, very good. And of course, the concept uh, came in uh, 1930. I'm just trying to remember the judgment, the judge who said it doesn't matter anyway because the principle is wonderful. Is that the law? The law should be what is deemed to be fair by the man on the Clapham omnibus. Mm. Um, or you might call him Joe Sixpack. Yes. Uh, what does he deem to be fair uh, as a fair-minded man? Uh, and the uh, that is the principle, uh, that is the basic principle of law. The presumption of innocence is absolutely vital, uh, which is not, of course, uh, in Europe, uh, that does not apply in Europe, uh, and we had our principles of English law subsumed by the European Union, uh, with a different set of a different set of law, a different kind of law, um, which was fascinating. And of course, that's, that was a major principle: uh, the concept of habeas corpus, uh, which, of course, I know that the British and the Americans from time to time suspend, yes, uh, quite wrongly and badly, but they, but they do. But the principle that you have to bring a man uh, to justice or let him go, you can't have it both ways. You can't bang him up uh, in prison uh, without bringing him into trial. Well, that doesn't follow in Spain or France. They don't have anything like that in Spain or France. Right. Their legal systems are completely different. Uh, and so we've always regarded um, the principles of English law for being a shield for the citizen, not a stick with which to beat him, which is what it's manifested itself into. Uh, and this, of course, is this is quite wrong. So what we should have in school uh, as well, going back to school, it should be learned at grandma's knee, as it were, uh, the principles of English law, uh, because uh, we every generation has, has a stewardship of law, of English law and American law. 
and the stewardship of your constitution, for example, and the stewardship of our constitutions, uh, which which uh, are not formulated in the same way as America, but are there nevertheless. The 1688 Bill of Rights, the 1688-89 Toleration Acts. These should be taught at school because if children don't know that they have the stewardship of these things and they're theirs by birthright, it makes it so easy for, for people, politicians, to take it away. If you don't know you have it, it's so easily stolen. And this is the problem. Uh, we have a whole generation, I would argue, a second generation now, who are so woefully ignorant of what they've got uh, that it's uh, it makes them uh, uh, susceptible to the Roman uh, kind of uh, uh, system that they had of bread and circuses. They watch their TV. Uh, they don't go to the barricades because they don't have an empty belly. And so consequently, you're dealing with whole vast millions and millions of people who have obviously no idea uh, how uh, their rights as, as, as individuals are being trespassed upon by these ghastly individuals. Well, that's right. As you talked about English law, English common law, I thought about the Napoleonic Codes. People aren't even aware that there's a fundamental difference in these two bodies of law because there are fundamentally different concepts of what a human being is, okay, and, and what a man is and what a man is for. And fundamentally, you know, the English common law from which we Americans inherit says, well, what are the rights of man? Well, all of them accept, as opposed to the Napoleonic Codes, which more or less say, well, what are the rights of a man? Uh, let me check and see what the book says. Now, now, starting from these two different foundations, you get a fundamentally different construction of, 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 again, what the law should be, what it's supposed to be, and where it should leave off, where the law should have no power, where, there should, where the law shouldn't speak, where there should be no jurisdiction. And so the, the undermining of foundations, um, which is something we often talk about in the foundation of society, and the, the, the blurring of boundaries and the elimination of hierarchies. Um, th these, these are just fundamentally destructive things and kind of we're, we're living with that destruction now. I want, you, you mentioned the, the EU and I wanted to get into, into that a little bit because you have some history obviously going toe to toe with, um, with, the, uh, with the great and good in, in the sausage factory of the EU, you were um, you were a, a member of European Parliament for the UK party for uh, I believe it was uh, Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. That's quite right. And um, i I wanted to get your take on this because you know I started paying attention to British politics around the time of uh, the the Brexit debate. I thought it was one of the most exciting things that had happened in politics for a long time. Uh, uh, on either side of the Atlantic, I thought it was very interesting that imaginative politicians could go into places that were that had been kind of historic labor strongholds and persuade people that the party their grandparents knew was no longer serving them um, and, th and then could put together a kind of a political coalition where you could have uh, someone like a Claire Fox and an Anne Whittacombe on the same stage. Talk to me about your experience as an MEP, your inside take on the EU, why you think the people who are trusted to govern are so afraid of governing that they're willing to hand over that power to a bunch of bureaucrats in Brussels. Fascinating, isn't it? Uh, absolutely fascinating. I don't understand it myself. I've never really understood the psychology of it. I would dearly love to be prime minister in order to do things. Yes. Change things. Roll back the state. Roll back taxation. Uh, uh, bring forward libertarianism in its true form. I'd like to do all these things. I don't want to be prime minister. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get to be prime minister just to be prime minister. And we've had prime ministers now, with the, you'd have to go right back, I think, to Margaret Thatcher. Everybody after Margaret Thatcher just wanted to be prime minister. It was their ambition at Oxford or wherever it was to be prime minister, but not to do anything. And nobody ever asked them on the television set uh, or, or, or in interview, if you become prime minister, what is it what you want to do? 
I knew going to live in number 10 Downing Street. You're going to have a lovely car driven by a, a chauffeur at the expense of the taxpayer. Uh, absolutely marvellous. And, and, and you're going to run around the globe shaking hands with the with the president of uh, the United States and being photographed and all this. That's all marvellous. But what do you actually want to do? And they had no ambition. They still have no ambition. None of them have an ambition to actually do something for the country. They couldn't wait to actually get rid of the responsibility of government so they could pose on the world stage but not do anything. And so, the sooner we got out of the European Union, where we'd handed over the responsibility of government to the European Union in Brussels and Strasbourg, we handed that. And now, of course, we won Brexit and we've handed it over to the World Economic Forum. Forum. Right. So we're still not governing ourselves. Uh, and it's absolutely quite extraordinary that politicians want to get rid of the, They want the trappings of power and government, but they don't actually want the responsibility to do anything. And I've never fully understood people like that. But then, of course, I think, and I'm sure you, you, you would probably agree with this, Mike, um, there's something wrong with politicians. Why would you want to be a politician? <laughs> well, there's the sort of people that politics at, uh, attracted. I mean, I'm as a city fund manager, I was a businessman in the city. Uh, I was an investment manager. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I finished my career actually as a chief executive of a life insurance company of all, uh, of all things. Uh, and that's me. But I wanted Brexit. So I went to politics for 10 years in order to do something which was actually Brexit. I went to do something. And as soon as that was finished, I was out of politics. And coming back to that, interesting, I worked for the Warburg Empire, Mercury Asset Management in the city, which is one of the world's leading investment banks, uh, by a long way, a very, very posh investment bank, a uh, European bank, uh, global, but I mean, uh, European in, in, in that sense of the word. And um, I was dealing with people who were unbelievably clever in every respect, and well-informed and well-read. And when I got into politics, um, fascinatingly, um, I couldn't believe the people were so hopeless, the people were so stupid. Uh, <laughs> and this was really quite astonishing. I thought that when I got into politics, we all know that politicians do the most stupid things, that I would be taken behind some green bay's door. Yes. And politicians would point out why they do these things. And I would say, gosh, I didn't know that. I understand now right. why you do this. <laughs> but there isn't a green base door. No. <laughs> These people really are exceptionally stupid. And when I was in Washington, um, uh, I, I visited all sorts of places and did all sorts of things when I was there. Um, but I, uh, one of them was the Brookings Institute. Uh, I went to see some people at the Brookings Institute, and they all had their wonderful Brooks Brothers suits on. They were immaculate. Uh, well-groomed, very articulate. But when I asked them what their, what their war aims were, and the mm. great thing about America is there was always a war, so you <laughs> might ask them, there is always a war aim. Yeah. Uh, and they looked at me absolutely bewildered, bewildered. And do you know what the response was? I think it was in uh, the second Iraq war, I can't remember. And it really doesn't matter because it could have been Syria. It could have been anywhere. Yeah. Um, what was the war aim? Do you know what the response from the, Brook, the, uh, the, the Brookings Institute guys was? It was, a, you know, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. <laughs> I just stared at them. These people Jesus. have the levers of power. So they're controlling one of the greatest navies the world's ever seen, one of the greatest economies the world's ever seen, and these people are inherently stupid. That's extraordinary. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this I, is... know, I, just, I, still, I still gaze in wonderment at how these people get there. Well, you know, what's, there. what's even funnier about that is the Brookings Institute is supposed to be a conservative think tank. These people are supposed to have some sense of history. I mean, they're supposed to... I got to... no whiff of conservatism in the Brookings no, Institute no, at all. Man. That's correct. That's correct. And, and that, that brings me to another thing uh, that I have in my notes to speak with you about, is that it does seem that one of the fundamental problems we have in politics on both sides of the Atlantic is that we no longer have uh, either a true conservative party or a true conservative contingent in, 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 in government or a true liberal 
contingent. And you know, liberal on your side of the water, you may say liberal in in, in a Gladstonian sense, right? But you, but indeed, we would. I would. Yes. You 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 simply don't have that, and so um, this is a problem. I have a theory that I'd like to run by you, which is that our um, just as just as for example, Peter Hitchens talks about World War One as the beginning of the end uh, for Christendom in the West. Uh, because because the the um, because the people in power and the clergy were in lockstep in this war and 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 they sent off so many young people who were glad to fight and 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 there was all this mythology of it being a, a almost a holy crusade and this is going to be the war to end all wars and it was such a colossal waste and a colossal slaughter. And then uh, uh, the, this war that was supposed to end all wars, of course, ended. And then after about a generation, you did the same damn thing all over again. So he, Peter Hitchens talks about World War I as being that kind of watershed. I think that the Cold War was a similar kind of watershed in terms of our ability to even articulate a proper conservative politics or a proper liberal politics. What we got at the end of the Cold War, it seems to me, was two camps of neoliberal hacks wearing different cultural paint jobs. What's your take on that? No, I totally agree with you. I mean, we're talking here about uh, it doesn't make any difference whether you vote red or blue or your side of the fence, and because it's still red or blue, our side of the yeah. pond here. Yes. Uh, but no, it doesn't make any difference. You're dealing with a form of neo-socialism and statism, yes. uh, and that is what has uh, transpired. And if you look, and every funny, funny, it's interesting you make the observation Gladstonian liberalism, uh, which I, which I'm totally would endorse. Uh, uh, this side of the pond, we regard liberal. Uh, as being liberal in the uh, dictionary sense of the word, not in the political sense of the word, um, uh, which, of course, in America, liberal means, uh, you know, extreme left wing, yes. uh, if you will. Uh, and so that's that's an interesting concept. But everybody talks about Gladstone, but I did write an article. I don't know whether you spotted it. It's on my website. I, I, I wrote it for Going Postal on Lord Salisbury. Now, Lord Salisbury, in the latter part of the 1800s, uh, was the last true real conservative uh, who ran the most successful uh, government, conservative government, government in history. And that's not just my assessment. That's the assessment of Clement Attlee, the socialist post-war prime minister. Lord uh, Salisbury was a libertarian. And when I uh, was going. I was going to give a talk to the Conservative Association at Cambridge University, and I was deplatformed to talk about Lord, the the administration of Lord Salisbury in the 1890s, which was obviously too rich for the average Cambridge University undergraduate. <laughs> they couldn't be exposed to me, uh, and I was told that at the last minute. Uh, that it was just not going to happen because, you know, they had to consider the safety of their students. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what they thought this little old man, Godfrey Bloom, was going to do when he turned up to talk about Lord Salisbury. Uh, but there we are. But he's got some absolutely wonderful quotations, and I quoted them, and I was going to quote them to the audience uh, that night, uh, which sadly I couldn't do, but I did uh, put it in my uh, interview on Lord Salisbury, uh, my uh, article on Lord, Sa Lord Salisbury. Fascinating. He was a true, uh, he was a true uh, libertarian conservative. And some people think you can't be a libertarian conservative. Well, I can tell you, you can be. Uh, you can be. They're, they're not mutually exclusive at all. Um, uh, so it's a great shame. But of course, after the war, after the, in 1945, uh, we had a socialist, a really rabid socialist government, a really rabid socialist government yes. uh, in, in, in Britain under Clement Attlee, who in his own way wasn't a bad bloke. He wasn't a bad bloke, Clement Attlee. He was just hopelessly misguided. And an electorate, which is understandably misguided, of having, having uh, in 1945 an attitude uh, that, uh, that they were just about fed up. And this government came along and this political party, Labour Party, said, everything, we're going to take care of you from cradle to grave. You're going to be looked after. Uh, uh, your education, your pensions, your social welfare, your health. The government, well, it's pretty attractive if you've been in the desert getting your head shot off for the last five years, isn't it? I mean, I'd have probably voted for the buggers. Uh, and this is... <clears throat> 
And therefore, we've had socialism. We've had this, and it's the same in Europe, who are very prone to socialism, of course. The Europeans are very prone to socialism. Uh, and the, the state will look after them regardless of circumstance. And we now have the second the second generation who believe that it is the state's responsibility to look after them, not themselves. There's no, there's no sense of it. Well, it's what will the government do? The government should do something. Uh, you know, there isn't this or this, this, this and this. Whatever it happens to be, the government should do something. Not I should get, get off my bum and do something myself. And of course, when you're taxed as a socialist government, we're now the highest taxed uh, as a nation, we're the highest tax for in, in 50 years. You can't break free because you can't save your own money. You can't pay for your own education unless you're wealthy. You can't pay for your own health because um, the government is taking so much money, you've lost your independence. And so you're dependent on mummy all the time, sucking at the teat and hoping you'll get some droppings from the table and all this kind of thing. And that's, and that's one of the problems that we have. People have come to believe that the state is their savior. And the state, which is now crucifying the West with their net zero policies, their green policies, their high taxation, their socialism, what will happen is society will break down. Now, what will happen when society breaks down? Well, history tells us what happens when society breaks down. They won't turn around and say we have too much government. We had too much government. This is the government's fault. They will throw out that government and bring in another government who will be even more draconian because the last one wasn't draconian enough. That's what people will respond. And that's where you get your fascism and your communism uh, in, in 1919. When society broke down in Europe, they didn't say what we need is a libertarian society. What we need is more power for the individual. What they actually said was, we need more government. And they turned to Hitler, they turned to um, Stalin, they turned to Mussolini, who was offering them you know, the firm hand, daddy, daddy and mummy will look after you again. And that's what people, 80 percent of the population want. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know where we go from there. I don't know how we move away from this. Most people believe uh, that it's the state's responsibility to look after them and they're quite happy. Well, it's even it's even worse than you say, because the problem, one of the problems with a state that assumes the responsibility to look after people is that pretty soon, f for ordinary, understandable political reasons, that state takes it upon itself to try to avert all bad outcomes. No state can avert all bad outcomes. And if you try, all that will happen is that the state will end up averting good outcomes that you actually do want. And so you definitely see this in your country. I mean, I've, I've heard lots of horror stories from my friends over there about people trying to do things on their own and some jumped up local council member saying, well, actually, you can't do that. Um, so so you, you get this kind of thing where everything that you would want to do, every initiative that you might take ends up being illegal. So not only are you kind of uh, uh, you know, starving the economy, not only are you taking away, confiscating in income that people might use in interesting ways, but you're also kind of squashing the, 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 the native creativity and the native kind of uh, uh, hustle of ordinary people in the street who really can, if given half a chance, figure things out and kind of make something of what they have. Uh, here in New York City, Airbnb was kind of disruptive for the hotel industry. Because what people found was that rather than go and stay in some $200 a room hotel in Manhattan, they could actually stay in someone's home when they came to the United States to visit. And you could have a better experience and spend less money. And the system was was kind of self-regulating. Uh, now, our supposedly conservative government went to war. That, that is the municipal government went to war against Airbnb. There's a you may not. Uh, rent your house to lodgers. Now, that's extraordinary because because then, then we're coming up against the question of, well, well, what is property actually then? I mean, this is my house and I can't do with it what I want. Then is it really mine? And, and again, that comes from this idea of, no, we have to we have to protect people against the possible negative implications of this or that happening. So it's even worse than what you say. And I'm um, while I'm not discouraged, I'm often um, dispirited 
at um, at the current situation. The same, of course, with Uber. Yes, um, yes, sir. Uh, that there's exactly the same principle. Uh, and the, here's the funny thing: is it's done by the lobby groups, the hotel lobby groups, the cab Correct. drivers, exactly. Uh, and if you've paid in New York, you've paid whatever it is, a hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is, to get your yellow cab license to drive a cab. Um, that's your lobby group. Uh, and of course, the, the, this is the problem. It's it's uh, it's pork barrel, as you say over there. It's, it's pork barrel politics all the time, isn't it? Correct. Now, here's the funny thing. Here's my experience. Uh, here's my experience. Uh, for example, Uber in London. Now, we all know the London Black Cab service. Yes. Um, is 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 actually one of the best in the world at, for what it is. Um, uh, you know, they know what they're doing. Uh, they're they're. They're very good at what they do. Uh, it's not cheap. Uh, but the person, they say, oh, well, it will kill the black cab drivers think that Uber's a bad thing because it's taking away their bread and butter. But that's not true because people who use black cabs, who prefer black cabs, will always prefer black cabs. Correct. Uber is much cheaper. However, your Uber customer is the customer not from a black cab. He's the customer that would normally take the tube Mm -hmm. uh, or subway, as you call it over there. He would say, I can get home. I can afford to get home with Uber. I can't get home on the black cab. I can't afford it. So what you have is much better. Uh, You have people who are actually using a form of taxi service, which they couldn't otherwise afford. If you're going to uh, New York, for example, if I'm visiting New York, um, I stay at the Lotus Club. That's, you know, I'm, most, I'm a member of the Lotus Club. So I stay there and it's just by Central Park and it suits me. It's very expensive. But I'm an old geezer and I can afford it. Um, uh, so people who go to New York, say, for a holiday, who stay in Airbnb, are people who would otherwise perhaps not go to New York. Correct. It doesn't really take any bedrooms away from the Waldorf. Uh, does it right. or the plaza right uh, or the lotus club uh, it brings people in who would not otherwise perhaps have visited that city um so it doesn't even work for the people it doesn't even work in forms of port barrel politics yes that's correct well this this reminds me <laughs> that reminds me of a quote it was from some some british politician um who was responding to a socialist, responding to, to, to the socialist slogan uh, about um, needing to uh, break eggs to make an omelet. Say, well, you know, this and that, this has whatever side effects, but if you want to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. And what he said was, well, very well, but where's the omelet? <laughs> right. I mean, we yeah. so you don't in other words, you don't yeah. even get the, 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 the good effects that are promised. And this is a problem. Yes. It's the same here with education. I'll tell you what's quite interesting. A few years ago, homeschooling was very difficult. Yes. You know, you had that little man from the council around sniffing about uh, and making nuisance of himself. Now, incidentally, that's rather changed over here now. A lot of people, a lot of my friends are taking that, my younger friends are taking their children out of school because they're fed up uh, with the sort of wokery they're being taught. Yes. Uh, of whatever whatever the piece of wokery could be. Trans is the latest thing yes. uh, and all that kind of stuff. And the denigration of British history. Uh, so they're taking their kids away. Now they take the kids away and they don't hear anything from the system at all. The system can't be bothered. They just think, oh, that's one piece of less responsibility. The kid's gone. Uh, and those parents are then taking their children to museums. Uh, they're still getting their sport because they play sport at the local you know, uh, football club or whatever it is for children. So they're not missing out anything. And they go to dance classes or whatever it happens to be. They're not missing anything, not by being at school. Uh, and you can, of course, teach more to a child uh, in a few hours one-to-one under those circumstances and a child will ever learn in a huge classroom. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, and, and, and you've got the like-minded, your parents. Uh, and people pay for public schools here, of course, as you know, that's uh, what you would call a well, private, private school, school over there. Yeah. And people, people pay a fortune for that. And they only pay for that uh, because they've got the same values. All the parents have the same broad values. 
uh, uh, that they share. But that's now not translating into the schoolroom. Yes. Your school teachers in your private school are just as woke as they are in the state school. And for that, you're paying six thousand, seven thousand dollars a term. And people are going, no, I'm not going to do that. And then they go to university where they learn absolutely nothing except wokery. Um, Now, I was uh, in uh, Arizona uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, It could have been anywhere. Uh, And uh, we were just waiting by a bus stop. It was sort of in the middle of nowhere sort of bus stop uh, in a park, some kind of park. Uh, And it was very hot. And two children were in the shade sitting on a bench. There had been about 11 or 12. And one of them came over and said... uh, to me and my wife, you know, would you like to come in here and take this seat? It'd be a lot more comfortable than shade. How very nice, I thought. How charming is that? Uh, and I, I and I sort of scratched my head. I was so one is so unused these days to that kind of behaviour from children. Yes. And a lady turned up a bit later to pick them up in the in, in the shooting wagon and, and and all the rest of it. They were homeschooled. Yes. They were homeschooled. Yes. And I should have realised that. Yes. They were articulate. <laughs> they looked you in the eye. They were a lovely couple of kids because they'd never been near a bloody school. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm an enormous fan of homeschooling. And uh, I mean, my experience has been the same as, as yours in, in, in that uh, when, when I find young people who are unusually well-mattered and well-behaved and, and, and kind of knowledgeable and, and, and courteous and what have you, very often I find that they've been homeschooled. And uh, th- this goes back to what we were talking about before. The state has taken upon itself the responsibility to educate children. Now, if you think about it, that's actually pretty unusual uh, in, in terms of, I mean, for most of human history, education meant showing your children how the world works. That was education. Showing how to do everything. That was education. Um, and and we've, we've, we've gotten used to the idea of education being uh, this phase of development where you send your children to be spoken to by strangers. Okay, fair enough. But th- the problem now is that we don't, we don't even get, again, you know, we've, we've broken some eggs to make an omelet, but we're not even getting the omelet. I'm always talking about homeschooling to people, anyone who will listen, and, and I'm hoping that more people uh, do that because the system needs disrupting. Um, and again, not just in, in what we call K through 12, you know, elementary education, but also, as you point out, higher education. I mean, here in the United States, you can pay a quarter million dollars or more for four year education. Now, that's madness. That's madness. And if all you get out of that is 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 a, a graduate who's learned to hate his country and hate everything his parents stand for and hate everything that's good and normal and decent. Then it's then then that system needs to go. I mean, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, you're quite you're quite right in pointing pointing out that this is a new phenomenon. The state running education is a relatively new phenomenon. Yes. Um, uh, it uh, you, you know the churches uh, the, the, there's all sorts of different forms of education, um, uh, but which weren't involved in the state and the old grammar schools in this country, of course, were were, were producing. Uh, they were selective. They selected bright kids and they taught them, uh, you know, in a, in a face the front and learn this kind of way. Uh, and it's fascinating uh, that if you look at the, the great and the good of yesteryear who were educated at grammar schools, uh, it's not all Eaton and Harrow and all right. this sort of business. Right. It's, it's uh, from, from fairly humble backgrounds, you know, humble middle class backgrounds where the kid can get on and, and go ahead and get to be, you know, the top of their, their professions. And of course, the great entrepreneurs, um, uh, none of the great entrepreneurs in Great Britain that I know of anyway, went to university. Yeah. All the really successful businessmen, and I don't mean in the huge civil service style like BP and Shell. I'm talking about somebody who actually built a business out of nothing, who's built a FTSE company or a S&P 500 out of nowhere. They never went to university. Hardly ever did they go to university. Yes. Uh, and so consequently, it, one does beg the question, what are you getting out of this? And the answer is not very much. And here is the same with um, health. We have this wonderful health system, which is free at the point of delivery. The only problem, of course, it isn't free and it isn't delivered. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, do you know how much it costs? This might amaze some of your listeners. Mm. This is pretty amazing. It's £2,400. Let's call it $3,000. Uh, for your people, three thousand dollars 
per head of every man, woman and child in the country annually. Uh, now, of course, when you think that, OK, babies, young mums and stuff, but generally speaking, most people go for years without needing the health system. Correct. You know, you're fit from, from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50. You don't really have much wrong with you. So consequently, these people aren't even using it. So we are paying a fortune. And I think it was um, it was an American whose name just slips my mind for a moment. But I know he said, if you think if you think health health service is expensive, wait until it's free. <laughs> uh, I like that. <laughs> and yeah. uh, uh, and this is the point. We're paying a fortune. The waiting. Everybody's going private now. If you can afford it, if you're middle class and can afford it, uh, my uh, sister-in-law needed a hip replacement. Um, fifteen thousand, fifteen thousand pounds. They paid for it out of their savings because she was in great pain, and there was nothing that could be done. The waiting list was a, a year. There is no health service here. There is no health service here. I'm private. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have anything to do with the national health system. And I tell you another reason I don't have anything. Well, I don't want to be on their computer. Do you want to be on a health computer in Britain with the national health when we've handed over our, our health system to the WHO, the World Health Authority, who are sooner or later going to make certain sorts of <clears throat> experimental drugs compulsory? Yes. I don't want to be on the computer. I don't want a policeman knocking at my door saying, He's going to take me away unless I submit to experimental spike protein therapy. Yes, that's correct. Well, it, I don't want to be. I haven't left for better service. I haven't left for better doctors because you get the same doctors that you pay for. They're the same doctors. They just go on every once a week to the private clinic. Right. I'm not getting better treatment. I'm getting off. I'm getting off that computer. Yes, yes. It's funny. Years ago, when I was on the left. Um, you know, I was I was of course in favor of of, uh, of nationalized healthcare and, and and what have you, and even when I started journeying toward the right, uh, I was still open to the idea that something like a national healthcare service could possibly be good. Here we we would call it Medicare for all, for example, but you know the, the last couple of years, the great viral freakout, as it were. Um, that pretty much sealed the deal. I said, no way. Like, Im imagine, I, you know, here in, I, I, well, as far as the COVID freakout is concerned, uh, you all had it a lot worse than we had it in terms of the 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 um the misery that your government was able to inflict on you. Here, it wasn't quite so bad, simply because we have fifty different governments, and uh and 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 the federal government even though it overreaches regularly is it's it it doesn't have um uh, doesn't have that much authority and, and still a, a a great many people have been harmed by this response and just imagine what it would be like here in the united states if um if most of our doctors worked for the government um yeah so so uh, it, it, once again we have an example of We've got these broken eggs, but where is the omelet? Whenever I tune in to, uh, or whenever I get some some um, news from the UK on my feed, I always hear these politicians you have over there, and they're always saying this thing that I just find so intensely stupid, it, it actually infuriates me. They say, we have to save the NHS. You, you've heard them say this before. Well, you know, people, yeah. we, need, we need to lock down the population or people have to wear masks again or whatever because we have to save the NHS. What are you talking about? You know, I mean, for God's sake, the point of a national health service, if nothing else, is to save you. <laughs> yeah. It's extraordinary. It's, incre it's incredible to save the NHS. It's just... Just absolutely amazing. I think, yes, I thought we paid all this money, so they saved us. And, of course, the other institutional things have gone out of the window as well. Uh, and there's nothing uh, this uh, being exposed by the experimental spike protein therapy. Yes. Um, what happened to the Hippocratic Oath? Uh, the doctors, doctors are administering this, um, and they're getting $20 a jab or whatever it yes. is. Yes, yes. Uh, and... I spoke to my private doctor, who's NHS really, but he'd, I'd see him on Fridays by appointment for 80, 80 quid. And that works out quite well because, um, you know, I get seen when I want to be seen, if I want to be seen, which is very often. And he does what I want. Uh, but in uh, 14 months ago, 
I sent him some reports I was getting because I got a web page on this. I was the first. I was the first guy in uh, pointing out all this in Britain. Uh, that the experimental spike protein therapy was not all it's made up to be. Uh, I was the first person that said, just a minute, this COVID is a bug. If you go to bed with a glass of whiskey and lie down for a week or so, you'll be all right. <laughs> I was the first person that's saying all this kind of stuff. Three years ago, I was coming up with this. Uh, and it's now becoming slightly, everybody's beginning to say. But I sent him this, I sent him a lot of expert opinion, <clears throat> which I was getting from all over the world, uh, 14 months ago, and he wouldn't have it. He would not have it. Wow. He clammed up. He wouldn't talk to me. There was no eye contact. And it's the same with all uh, general practitioners and doctors. Now, now we're getting oncologists, we're getting cardiologists, we're getting all sorts of people now beginning to say, just a minute, this is dead. But this is three years in. Three years in. You know, this Correct. is far too late. Correct. And, and, um, and far too late. And by the way, you know, a, an awful lot of pregnant women and women of childbearing age have been administered this thing. And it's extraordinary. I mean, you talk about doing no harm, but I mean, this is just, this is just basic ethics. You look at the, the insert slip that you get if you open, if you open a, a, a traditional vaccine, and even that insert has warnings about administering this thing to pregnant women. And here we have this thing that's, that, was, that was brought on the market in a huge hurry with legal indemnity granted to the manufacturers by legislative fiat for the amount we pay for health care in your country and mine. Our health care professionals should have been on the ball three months in, three weeks in, not three years in. I mean, this is madness. It's quite insane. And we get this crazy situation, do we not, with uh, <clears throat> a, a pregnant women they can't. They mustn't eat shellfish. They mustn't smoke. They mustn't drink right, alcohol. Right, right. There's a whole list right. that a pregnant woman cannot do. Right. And now, what kind of nurse or midwife sits down and administers this experimental, experimental spike protein for an almost zero risk for Thank a young, you. healthy woman in her thirty or twenty-eight or whatever it is? Her chances are zero. As Correct. close to zero as, as can you be, can get. Correct. dying from this. How, mm. When they go home at night, when they go home, what are they thinking? They go to bed at night with their family, the midwife or the nurse or the doctor, the GP. Right. What are they thinking as they stare at the ceiling? What What are they thinking? Right. Can they Can they sleep at night? Uh, uh, sometimes they don't one, seem to care. They don't seem to they care. They don't seem to care. Yeah. It's 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 rather extraordinary. I mean, I I um. You know, I th I think I mean I'm 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 into politics. It, it's not what I do for a living, but I, I find it interesting and 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 I like a good fight. I like a good argument, and you know, I'm I'm nostalgic for old fashioned political corruption. That is to say, you know, um, everyone everyone gets the idea that politicians will do some self dealing. Everyone gets the idea that people will occasionally skim off the top. Everyone gets that, but this is something different. This is uh, this. I mean, the 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 kind of the casual cruelty of this of this so called healthcare regime. You know, the idea that you 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 you're not just giving these experimental substances, which have not been fully tested out, to young women of childbearing age to pregnant women. And you're suppressing news of injuries, and then you did more than that with the, with these with these interventions, with these lockdowns, with this with this uh, 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 quarantining, which is not traditional quarantining at all. Traditional quarantining means that healthy people stay away, not that everyone decides to be afraid of air. Okay, um, the idea of consigning old people to die alone without human contact, surrounded by strangers, wearing masks. I mean, this is. You know, uh, there's a there was a documentary uh, that I was watching. It's, it was about World War Two, and this was near the end when they had started to open up the, the the camps, and and they saw what was going on. And I believe it was Winston Churchill said, "We are in the presence of a crime without a name." And that's the feeling I get when I watch these people. 
Absolutely. It's uh, it's very it's very depressing. And my wife, who is a medic, um, is also equally depressed by it. She was right on at the beginning. She she she, uh, she was the same. And, and and a lot of my friends. And when it came to lockdown, and this is what we all have to do, uh, we took as little notice as we could. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a small holding in East Yorkshire. Um, you know, a few chickens, few horses, and few you know bits and pieces like that. We just built a pub. Uh, we just built a small pub on the, on the back of a barn, hmm. uh, and uh, the village came round, and we just carried on as best we could. That's beautiful. We took absolutely no notice of any of it. <laughs> That's be- you know what's funny is is um, you know I'm, uh, you know by now that I'm a big fan of Chesterton, and um, I, I'm I'm thinking about what Chesterton would have thought about the closing down of pubs. As far as British politics are concerned, I have the feeling that that the pub as such, that the, the institution of the pub is this uh, kind of reservoir of common sense and and argument and skepticism and, and, and what have you. And a part of me thinks that this whole regime would never have gone down uh, if you had had the pubs open. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, it's, you make a... You make an interesting point, and I did a I did a video on this a couple of years ago when mm. Boris Johnson said, you know, he was closing this and closing that, and the lockdown was happening, and he said, uh, pubs pubs did not deliver an essential service. <laughs> That's nonsense. And I thought this is a man who is so out of touch with Correct. reality it beggars belief. Right. What if you're a what if you're a widow or a widower? You live alone. Yes. And your only pleasure was going to the pub maybe once a week or maybe twice a week just to get human contact with other people, discuss other people. And and this, to suggest that it wasn't a central service, so that he, sim- he had his bar, he had Annie's bar. Yeah. They all went to the bar, the cheap subsidised bar they have in, in the House of in Westminster. House of Westminster and we know now how much how much notice Boris Johnson took of it. He was caught up, that, partying. That's, that's right. That's so he right. didn't believe any of this. He didn't. But it was for us, ordinary people. We saw we had policemen arresting arresting women walking their dog in the park. Yes. And again, it begs the question, Mike. It begs the question: What what does the policeman say when he goes home? Yes. What well, when when is Daddy Daddy? What did you do today? Right. Oh, it was an interesting day. I arrested a young woman for walking her dog in the park. Right. Oh, Daddy, you're such a hero. What's wrong? <laughs> What's wrong? procedure well i mean this is we i mean uh, we, we could have a whole other conversation on uh, on how far from uh from the peeling and model of policing you've departed right i mean i mean they are they, they, at this point your police are pretty much a politicized weaponized oh, yeah. arm of the government yeah. and that's it it's no longer police being the people and the people being the police that's long gone um but yeah this is again we we seem to be we seem to be um, coming back to this pattern of uh, having made all these sacrifices and and not even getting the, the, the benefits one would expect. You make an excellent point, Mike, because I've often said this. Uh, let's take Singapore. Yes. Uh, I, you know, I've worked all over the world here and everywhere, so I know plenty of places. Uh, Singapore. Now, Singapore is a very authentic, Authoritarian state, uh, you know, you can't spit gum on the, uh, uh, you know, on the uh, this. You can't do this and you can't do that. Well, you know, fair enough. It's it's a very it's a very sort of tough environment. However, it's very successful commercially, uh, and GDP per capita goes all the time, and it's overtaking everywhere else, and it's and all that's fine. Now, if you're going to pay tax and live in a fairly authoritarian environment. They are delivering the omelette. It may not be the omelette that you want. It might not be the flavor you want, but by goodness me, there's an omelette on the table. There's very little crime. It's the same with Dubai. There's no crime. Uh, you're living in a society, uh, Switzerland to a certain extent, you don't drop litter, you're nicked, and you don't go over the speed limit. It's not optional. These authoritative, authoritative kinds of regimes are not my cup of tea as a libertarian. But at least, at least you're getting something for it. We're getting nothing for it. We're living in a very, very tough authoritarian kind of style, uh, but we're not getting good education, good health. We're not getting low crime figures. 
We've got an island covered in litter. We're getting nothing for all this. I could exchange. I could. I could live in Switzerland or Singapore without too much trouble. Without too much trouble. Um, but at the moment, they're delivering nothing for us here in this country. We're getting absolutely nothing, uh, and 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 that's and that's the problem. But the the other problem is, of course, people. People no people don't simply care. Mm. They moan. <clears throat> they win. But they, deep down, they don't really care. You wouldn't find more than one person in ten in this country who's even ever heard of the World Economic Forum. You were, honestly, you wouldn't. Nobody would know. I spoke to a big landowner the other day, a very charming man. I've known him for years. Big landowner in Yorkshire, and he said, "Oh, you know, who will get the premiership? You know, will it be Sunak or will it be Truss?" And I said, "It doesn't matter. We're governed by the World Economic Forum." He said, "Who are they?" <laughs> wow. <laughs> He's one of the richest, biggest landowners in the north of England, and he didn't know. But but then, of course, if it's we have friends who've taken the booster, jab number four, because they want to go to Las Vegas for a holiday. Why anybody would dream of going to Las Vegas for a holiday? <laughs> I don't today. know. But they have. <laughs> um, and when we said, my goodness me, that's a bit brave, you know, it's a bit dangerous, you know, getting your fourth jab and your booster, people are dropping dead all over. The she didn't know. Yes. She didn't know. Yes. All they do is watch the BBC maybe for half an hour in the evening while they're having a cup of tea or something. And, of course, they're getting fed. That It's the same with Ukraine. Uh, it's, the, it's the same with Ukraine. I can assure you that nearly everybody in this country, in, in Great Britain, imagines that Putin woke up one morning, was bored, hung over, didn't quite know what to do, and he suddenly had a brainwave. I know I'll invade the Ukraine. Purely on a whim. Keep me yeah, busy. That's right. That's yeah. what they truly believe. That's what they believe. I'm, talk- I'm not talking about idiot people. I'm talking one one guy who believes that <clears throat> is a is a mathematics graduate from Cambridge University, and I could name a whole list of people like that. Um, really, really highly uh, educated people um, uh, who, who imagine that to be the case. And if you, and worse, Mike, you try and explain that, that there's another side of the story here. Oh, no, don't do that. They become almost hysterical. <laughs> yes, uh, I've had that response. It's, yeah. it, I mean, this is, well, what this tells you, going back to what you said earlier about education, is that we have too many people, too many highly credentialed people, but, but on the whole, just too many people who have been educated as to what to think as opposed to how to think. That's, I think that yeah. the whole West, yeah. the whole of the Western countries have that. There's no critical thinking. Yes. There's no yes. challenge. There's no risk assessment. There's no risk assessment yes. involved and, here. And you see, that wouldn't be so bad, except that we also, uh, like, like for example, you know, one could argue that 500 years ago, okay, um, uh, in, 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 um, in England, you didn't necessarily have... Uh, a huge critical mass of people who uh, knew the trivium and the quadrivium and, and what have you. But but the problem is that this our our radical inability to reason honestly about these things is coupled with this kind of radical desire on the part of our political class and our elites to interfere with these things. Do you see what I'm saying? In, in other words, it, it wouldn't matter so much if we were dead wrong about Russia versus Ukraine, except for the fact that w- w- we insist on being in the middle of it. Well, you know, you could argue that, you know, my country is, is, is the one that really initiated the thing. We, we're, the, we're the people who, who kind of, uh, it launched those provocations, uh, uh, even, even back before 2014 and what have you. But the point is that th- there, is, there is a political class that, that um, that has an almost um, well, that has an almost socialistic stated desire to prevent bad outcomes. But the the problem is that is that intervening in a crisis and genuinely helping people is precision work. It requires you to get up close and really understand the underlying system. And, and, you know, going back to my ex-sister-in-law's point, to be able to take a history, to understand the context. And this is something, you know, I'd like to get your take on this, but it seems to me that, that it, maybe it's, I'm, I'm kind of going back to Chesterton again and thinking about what he had to say about modernism. 
and modernists and faddists and how precisely because they'd cut themselves off from history, they lived in a very narrow slice of time. And uh, maybe that's it. I'm, I'm not sure where that comes from, but but it's a very dangerous combination. And and, and we, we've come around to Ukraine at the right time because I wanted to get your take on this. It, you know, you, you yourself... Uh, Again, I've been following you for a while, and then I did some research. I found out that you, you had gone to the Royal Military Academy, uh, Academy at Sandhurst. You graduated in 1976. You were a logistics liaison officer with the 4th Army Division, and you uh, you were an associate member of the uh, College of Defense Studies, and you've given talks and things like that. You, you've actually, I mean, particularly being a logistics man, you, you have more of a sense of, of the essence of what war is than most people who think of it as a giant gunfight, right? Um, yes, that's what, true, yeah. The, you know, and the, you, you could tell the, the way our State Department, which, which uh, does not do foreign policy anymore, clearly, um, the sense in which they talk about wonder weapons, the sense in which their acolytes in the media kind of gleefully repeat these stories about wonder weapons, and all they need is, is this many more howitzers and this many more tanks and this many more. And I'm here thinking, well, how are you going to train on? First of all, how are you going to get this equipment there? Where are your spare parts? Well, what's your training regime? Where are you going to train these people? How are they going to train in 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 a, in a maneuver warfare context, so they understand how to not just how to flip the switches, but how to actually use this and maneuver and actually uh, engage on a bat. Where are you going to do this? And, 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 and in what time frame? Um, but, but so many of our elites, again, they lack that context. They lack the mental discipline. They lack all of those things. And that would be fine if they were happy to be isolationists. But they're not happy to be isolationists. <laughs> they really, really want to get involved. I'd just like you to sound off on that, you know, given your background and and um, and given that once again we've in, given that in this talk we've been talking about these these systems which are very expensive and from which we don't even get the stated benefit. I'm thinking now of NATO and the EU and the so-called kind of security apparatus that exists at great expense, supposedly to provide some form of security. What's, what's your take on all this? Well, so two questions you got there, like right? sort of two questions. Yes. Funny enough, I put out a video last night uh, on this very business of logistics, <clears throat> which was published overnight, which is uh, still up on my website, will remain up on my website, uh, just picking up on these particular things. Um, I actually started as a young man, as a trooper, with uh, light, light armoured reconnaissance. Mm. Uh, and of course, as a young soldier, uh, I didn't think anything. <laughs> I didn't think, it didn't occur to me that something had to come. My, uh, the ammunition or the petrol had to come from anywhere. I just assumed it would be there, you see, as a yes. young fellow. Yes. And I transferred to logistics uh, a few years after that, um, where, of course, the whole game is, how do you get... Uh, how do you get your stuff where your stuff want to be? And of course, the 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 the, the art of logistics is you know what, what do you need? How are you going to get it there? Uh, what are you going to do when you've got there? And of course, this is what most people don't understand. And I have to say that most senior generals don't, don't understand, understand either. Correct. Correct. Uh, and uh, D D Douglas McGregor made this point, and it's the same in England. You can't get above one star rank uh, in this country unless you're politicised. You can't be a chief of police unless you're politicised. Uh, and so once you get above the rank of colonel, you're selected for promotion if you're OK with all sorts of wokeism, you know, trans in the, in, in the army uh, and, 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 and women at sea, whatever happens to it, all this kind of thing. That's how you get promoted. <clears throat> now, uh, yes, the, the, the problem is we're now talking, everybody's talking about, and particularly backbench MPs with no military experience whatsoever, um, and if they do have military experience, they're extremely rare, and it's only at regimental level. You know, if they were a captain in the guards or something like that, well, you know, that's that's not real military experience. Uh, you know, right. when it comes when it comes to strategy, it might be a might, might be a jolly good chap, a very brave chap. Uh, you know, getting a head shot off somewhere useless like Afghanistan, but that doesn't make you an expert on warfare. So what we're saying is now, the British are saying, are we going to give them the Challenger two tank? Well, the Challenger 2 tank doesn't have the same ammunition as the Leopard tank. Correct. 
the Leopard tank is diesel, the Abrams is petrol. So consequently, you've got all different things you've got to deliver. Right. And then, of course, you can't put tanks in theatre without backup from uh, infantry. The infantry has to clear the way. You can't just have armour. You have to have in- infantry supporting. You have to have artillery support, which is extremely sophisticated these days. Uh, you know, it's all computerised, and it, it's not, you're not putting a cannonball down there and touching off. No, God, those, those, it's long gone those days, people. It's long gone. And then you've got your Patriot missiles, where you need it takes months and months to train somebody to fire these sophisticated things. Correct. Uh, and then you need workshops. What happens when the tanks break down? And they do. Believe Correct. me, they break down all the time. You need workshops. You need forward workshops quite close to the front line. And then, of course, you need air support. Uh, you need air support. And the Germans found out in Normandy and the Falaise Gap and places like this that they don't matter how good their tanks were, they had the best tanks, some of the best soldiers, without doubt, and some of the most disciplined soldiers, the most experienced soldiers. But you can't because you don't have air power. It's all terribly integrated. Yes. Uh, you can't just give a guy a, a tin hat and a gun. You know, those days have long gone. If indeed, if they were ever here, correct, uh, you could go back to the British archers. We beat the French time and time again. Much bigger armies than us because we had highly trained archers. You know, this isn't a new concept. And then you've got to get the. You need the soft. You need the transport. <clears throat> you need the soft transport. Uh, you need. You've got to get the petrol there. They've got to be fed. You need ammunition. Where's all this going to come from? All we're doing is we're pouring money into the Ukraine at the moment. And we're sending uh, you know, fairly useless, obsolete equipment. <laughs> and, and and no good will come of this. All we're doing is extending the war. And one of the questions at, uh, at Staff College, uh, somebody asked, uh, Field Marshal Montgomery was giving the final lecture, and, and somebody said, uh, and I'm going back, you know, many, many years, um, you know, what, give, can you give us one tip? Yeah, give us one tip. Well, you know, a one-off sentence... Uh, as staff officers, you know, what should we bear in mind? And the response was from Field Marshal Montgomery, never march on Moscow. (laughs) And we've got all these people saying, are we going to win the war? We've got this. And if we give the UK, you don't beat the Russians on their own doorstep. No, no. (laughs) They are impossible. They have limited, unlimited resources, manpower. And they have space. And what people don't understand the strategic aspects of this war is that the the, the, the the Russian army has withdrawn and their strategy, their doctrine is to beat the Ukrainian army in the field. Yes. All right. That's that's what it is. They're not going to hold ground. They're not going to do what we did in the first one, hold Ypres, uh, <clears throat> you know, in, in the salient Correct. and lose lots of men for a piece of useless ground. Uh, Grant worked this out. Grant worked this out in your in your war. Yes, sir. Your North v. South war. It wasn't a civil war, incidentally, but that's another question. Um, it was a war between the North and the South. Not the same thing at all as a civil war. That's a good point. Uh, and uh, Grant, Grant said, I'm not going to try and capture Richmond. I'm not going to try and capture it. I've got to beat the Confederate army in the field. And that's what he did. And that's what they made. And once the Russians break out <clears throat> across the frozen ground, an armour can come into its own. And air, uh, they will almost certainly have air superiority. Um, there's, uh, and the Ukrainians can't get any reserves, <clears throat> can't train reserves. Uh, the war will be over by Easter. Yes. And the Russians will be in the driving seat. And they will, saying, they will be saying this is how it's going to be. And since, Mer- it doesn't matter. Merkel said that it, the, the Minsk agreement was fake. And we were only doing it so mm-hmm. we could to give us breathing space. It won't stop the man you argue with in the pub, <clears throat> who's pro-Ukrainian, waving his arms and foaming at the mouth. <laughs> he won't have it. He can't believe it. Any more than if you tell him that if he has the booster, he's quite likely to drop dead. <laughs> he won't. No, he can't deal with it. People can't deal with it. There's, there's been, a, I've noticed a lot of foaming, <laughs> a lot of foaming on the Ukraine, uh, on the Ukraine matter. And what's funny is I've, um, I've I've had an interest in Russia uh, for some time. I was beginning to pay attention to politics and world affairs right around the time the Cold War ended. And at, at that time, I saw the experiment that Russia conducted in pure capitalism. And it was, of course, it was a disaster. And, and uh, you know, Russians who lived, who were alive in those years will tell you it was just horrible. And then, and then Vladimir Putin came on the scene. 
and established order. And I noticed that uh, at first he was supposed to be the kind of, he, he was, uh, you know, Bill Clinton liked him apparently, talked about him in glowing terms, until he began to insist on certain things that went against the uh, the, the globalist doctrine of the time. I, th- I think the my, my working theory is I think the plan for Russia was that it was supposed to be a weak state that got cut up and sold for scrap by the currency speculators and, and you know people of that ilk. And when that plan got derailed, when the neoliberals found that they could not carry out that plan in Russia, then the leader of Russia became, uh, he, he had to become the devil incarnate. And uh, I was around for the Kursk uh, disaster, and, and I understood a little bit of what that meant in terms of how dysfunctional their systems were. Um, you can't even maintain your, 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 uh, your, your peroxide uh, uh, fueled torpedoes and so on and so forth. And I was around for the, I was paying attention to the, the, the reforms that Putin put in place in, in, in the Navy and the Army and so on and so forth. And so this many years later, uh, you know, a, a country that actually has paid attention to fundamental matters, a country that actually has had an industrial policy, as opposed to just mouthing platitudes about the free market and 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 exporting all their factories to other countries, a country that that's done all those things and has checked all those boxes, can now withstand a sanctions regime that. I don't know if it, it may be unprecedented. I've never seen this many sanctions put on a country at once, um, and fight off uh, and and fight off uh, the, the, this proxy NATO army that was trained and equipped by the U.S. and it's extraordinary. And people are in denial about what that means. What, what, one of the problems with the sanctions, which we didn't understand, because politicians are so, you know, just simply stupid people. You yes. know, what, what can you do? Simply stupid people. That was. And I could have told them this, and they'd pick the phone up to me, and I could have told them that it was going to be a mistake, because we get fertilizers and gas, petrol, and uh, all these things that we import from Russia into Western Europe in order that we, we, that we need, that we must have. They're must-haves. Yes. Now, the only things that the Russians buy for us, you know, they like, or, or from the West, they like Audis, they like BMWs, they like all that kind of stuff. Of course they do. Yeah. Of course they do. <clears throat> but they don't need them. <laughs> That's right. They're not a must for them. So we shot ourselves in the foot by, it always reminds me, <clears throat> if you remember Bla- Bra- Blazing Saddles, the film Blazing Saddles, yes. uh, when the black sheriff, <clears throat> if you remember, he rides into town and they're going to lynch him. Mm-hmm. And he puts a gun to his own neck and says, one pace forward here and I'll pull the trigger. <laughs> and suddenly mumbles, he's not kidding. <laughs> and that's what the West have done. They yes. held the gun to their own head <clears throat> and then pulled the trigger. Yes. And so consequently, you couldn't believe all this. And what's happened, of course, world markets know, uh, the ruble's gone up uh, since the beginning. It's gone up 8% against the dollar. The ruble is increasing against the dollar. Yes. All right? <laughs> And markets are telling you what you need to know. And, of course, on, instead of getting the peace dividend that we should have got, the peace dividend, um, if, if you look at the targets, the targets that the Soviet Union were using for, on the rifle ranges, mm-hmm. the faces that they had were Chinese. The, the threat that was perceived by the Soviet Union... Was the Chinese threat. ...and Russia mm-hmm. is the Chinese because they've got, you know, two million men or three million men under arms on their own border. And that was the threat. Now, our post-Cold War policy has managed to actually give them an alliance, the Chinese and the Russians, an alliance. Yes. How stupid have we been to to get that? That's not a natural alliance. Russia and China aren't natural allies. They're natural foemen. We've managed to do that. You couldn't invent all this stupidity. <clears throat> and then, of course, this business about we get from the mainstream media all the time is that Russia is isolated. Uh, well, no, <clears throat> you have to look at the Shanghai co- co- um, co- cooperation uh, sphere. Uh, you have to look at BRICS. You have to look at Africa. You have to look at the Stans. 
you have to look at the globe. Russia isn't isolated. That's right. That's we're right. isolated. <laughs> and we're becoming more and more isolated. Uh, yeah, this is just not... And, of course, the standard of mainstream media now is so low. You're, uh, 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 over here, we have defence correspondents from major newspapers and the BBC. Uh, Nick Beale is the BBC defence correspondent, OK? The BBC, the holy BBC. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know the difference between an able seaman and a colour sergeant. <laughs> uh, the, up until quite recently, the uh, the defence correspondent of the London Times was Lucy Fisher. Now, Lucy's a really nice lady, and she's really good on handbags. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> come on. But not the kind of person you want when you've got a world crisis on your hands, is she? <laughs> not at uh, all. We used to have John Keegan. We used to have Claire Hollingsworth. Going back, going back 30 years... And John Keegan was a, a, a correspondent for, I think, the Daily Telegraph or the London Times. He was the history, military history uh, uh, don at the Royal Military Academy, Santos. We had people who really knew their stuff. I mean, really, really, really knew their stuff, asking the right questions. <clears throat> we don't have anybody capable in mainstream media asking the right questions, never mind finding the answers. You made a point at the beginning, uh, actually, and you put your finger on it. We live in a society now where people don't know what questions to ask. Never mind trying to find the, the answers. answers. Right. They don't know what questions they ought to be asking. Right, right. And, and it gets worse and it gets worse. You know, we have to work out where we're going if I'm right and the Russians win. And the Russians get to Kiev and it's index in much the same way that happened in Vietnam and Afghanistan yes, and wh- wherever you want to name. What happens then? Uh, Because are they going to find a war somewhere else? Because we're now in a state of permanent warfare. Are they going to find a war somewhere else? Or are they going to determine on a sort of Gotterdammerung scenario, Wagnerian scenario, Mm -hmm. a sort of Berlin 1945 Caesarea where we'll all go down together? Mm -hmm. Dr. Strangelove. Or, you know, you can find any analogy you like. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, are the West going to resort to tactical battlefield nuclear weapons? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but, but it would be madness. And Putin's made it quite clear that the only concept for nuclear weapons for him is retaliatory. And that's always been the mutual assault destruction thing. We were safer when the Soviet Union was there. Correct. We, Correct. Were, sa- we were safer under the Ancien Regime. Because everybody was so frightened of a nuclear war, everybody was going to sit around a table and talk. And we seem to have people now, and I don't know whether it's because the people in Washington, the near, and that's where it starts, is Washington. So it's is Washington, Washington yes, the it problem? Does. Yes. Are they so deep in the ground in concrete bunkers that they really genuinely don't care what happens? I mean, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's not, um, it's not a thought that lends itself to a pleasant night's sleep. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, it certainly doesn't. Absolutely not. Well, uh, Godfrey Bloom, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just before you go, uh, tell people where they can find you online and where they can, uh, where they can uh, you know, view your, your work. If, if you're interested, <clears throat> if you're interested, anybody listening, my website carries absolutely everything I ever do. Videos, books, you know, the lot. It's all it's all there. Uh, and it's simple. It's Godfrey Bloom, small case, godfreybloom.uk. Excellent. And perhaps, Mike, you just tell us where my followers, this is going out of my net, where people can get a hold of you. Sure. My website is www.futurad.io, um, and that has that has many, though not all, of of the videos I've done, the podcasts I've done. It's also got the Foundationist Manifesto and and kind of what our organization, what we believe as an organization, and then on Twitter I'm Future Radio Cast, and you can just do a search. Um, on YouTube for for any videos that you don't find on on our website, uh, just search for Carbon Mike, and the name of my podcast is Dangerous Space. Well, my uh, 
my, my techie will put that on and make sure that people can press it or immediately the link to you as well. Because, well, perhaps it would be nice if, Mike, we got back together again round about Easter. Absolutely. <clears throat> and see whether we've been right or wrong on this. Absolutely. I'd love if to. If we're still here. Yes. If we're if not we're... some smoking hole in the ground because some <laughs> arsehole in Washington pressed them up. That's right. Well, let let's hope they let's hope they uh, they withhold their hand. Um, yeah, for, you know, for, from your lips to God's ear. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to get back uh, get back on with you and and um, and see where we are come Easter. Absolutely. Okay. Good luck to you and a belated Happy New Year, Mike, and to all your listeners. Thank you, and same to you and yours. Toodle pip. Bye. <laughs>